This July will mark the sixth wedding anniversary of my husband and I. I just want to say for the record that I am incredibly happy and that was the best decision I had ever made in my life. Now that I said that, I will say that we almost didn't make it to our wedding day because of a poor choice made by my then fiancé. Anybody who has ever gotten married knows that it's an obnoxious amount of planning. Even weddings on a smaller scale can cost a lot of money and take months of planning. I was stressed out of my mind trying to plan this wedding, and I told my fiancé to just worry about the photographer and I'll take care of everything else. I think it's also worth saying that I wanted it that way. I love him to death, but if it was up to him, we would have tacos and nothing but 80s music at the wedding. That may sound like a fun party, but I'm sorry, not for our wedding. I gave him a list of great photographers that I've seen online or recommended to me by my co-workers and friends. All he had to do was pick one that he liked from our budget and everything else would be taken care of. One night, he came home from work excited, like he just won the lottery. He told me that he was talking to a co-worker and this man suggested that he use someone that he knows to be the photographer. He was well under our budget and shot weddings before. I didn't love the idea because I didn't get to see any portfolios or anything like that so I didn't even know if this guy had a camera. My fiancé assured me that he saw his work and that he did a good job. The only reason he wasn't listed anywhere online is because it was his side job and he was just trying to make money and hopefully turn it into a career. I was instantly sketched out by the idea but I trusted him. My husband, then fiancé, had a great and horrible quality that allows him to see the good in people. I wasn't thrilled, but it was done, and I guess the positive was that we were saving a lot of money. Not far from the wedding, I still hadn't met the guy and I wasn't happy. I was starting to get anxious that this guy might not show up or something. I begged my fiancé to set up a meeting so that I could meet the guy. We met at the park where we were going to get married, and the guy was strange and... I know that sounds mean, but he just gave off that vibe. He had gross, dirty, and long fingernails. He was missing some teeth in the front, and I would guess that he was at least 40 years old. Based on the way my fiancé described him, I was picturing a young guy, not some grizzled older guy. He didn't say much and just kind of nodded along with what I was saying. I felt uncomfortable because it seemed like he was staring at me strangely. I tried to tell myself that I was just imagining it because his appearance was a little off, but I couldn't shake that feeling. He ended the meeting by showing me some pictures that he had taken for his portfolio. I expected to see some wedding photos, but they were weird. Some strange artsy photos of things like decay and dead animals and even buildings on fire. Finally, he showed me some wedding photos at the end, and admittedly, they were beautiful shots, which put me a little bit at ease. Now about a month away from the wedding, my girls and I went to Ocean City, Maryland for the bachelorette party. We rented a beautiful condo on the ocean and we planned on spending the days on the beach and the nights partying in town. It was an amazing time until late Saturday afternoon. While we were on the beach, one of my friends said that she could see some creepy guy seemingly taking pictures in our direction. The guy was standing outside the building, facing us. There was a lot of distance and beach between the man and us, so I just assumed that he was taking pictures of the ocean. My friend couldn't relax, though. She finally got up and said that she was going to confront this guy, just for peace of mind. She and another friend walked all the way over to the man, and I could see them talking. After a couple of nods, the man walked away, and my friends walked back to us. She said that he was just taking pictures of the ocean, and he even showed them. He apologized for freaking them out and said that he would walk further down and take pictures there. I smiled and gloated to my friends for a minute telling them that I had told them so. And it wasn't until we were walking back that my one friend said something that really freaked me out. She said, That photographer guy was creepy though. Ew, and did you see his fingernails? It was disgusting. And right away, I thought about our photographer for the wedding. I told myself that it was just a coincidence, but the feeling in my gut was not a coincidence. That night, we went to one of the local bars and every time I saw someone take a picture, I felt my adrenaline kick in. I was freaked out and the longer the night went on, the more freaked out that I became. I told the girls that I wanted to go back to the condo, and when we got back, we decided to make some drinks there and just talk. 
Around 1am we heard a knock on the back door. We all looked at each other kind of in disbelief and thought, there's no way someone's knocking at this time, right? We weren't that loud. As a group we all huddled around the door and when we opened it, nobody was there. We thought that either some kids were playing some joke on us or we were all just going nuts. We decided to go to bed not long after that moment. Now maybe 30 or 40 minutes later, I heard one of my friends scream. She had been sleeping on the couch since we were one bedroom short. When we all ran into the living room, there was some guy just standing there with a camera. I was stunned at what I was seeing. It was my wedding photographer just standing there and through all the chaos he just kept saying, I just figured you guys want some pictures. I'm only trying to take pictures, so just relax. One of my friends grabbed a knife from the kitchen and started to chase this man out of the condo. We immediately called the authorities and explained everything to them. The following day we returned home and I angrily recounted the incident to my fiancé. And while I understand it was not his fault and he couldn't have known, I was upset with him at that moment. The local police were informed and before long, the man responsible was apprehended. His excuse that he was merely attempting to take our pictures and didn't intend to frighten us or break in didn't hold up. Fortunately, we managed to find another photographer in time for the wedding, and I quickly realized that my fiancé wasn't to blame. My advice to young couples planning weddings is to always ensure that you're familiar with the individuals you hire because sometimes trying to save money can turn out to be the worst decision of your life. Wedding season is always a lucrative time of year for me. I work for some fancy reception hall that hosts weddings pretty much every Friday and Saturday from May until October. Some events are fun and others are horrible. Since the company is small and family owned, they try and do everything themselves. When it was becoming too much, they hired me. I'm basically a glorified handyman. I help set up the weddings, help assist with wiring, and most importantly, I'm the guy who stays late and cleans everything up especially on Friday nights, since Saturday another wedding will be taking place right after. I always like weddings that are small and quiet because then I'm not spending hours cleaning up the place, since those folks tend to be a bit more reserved. But in the story I'm about to tell you, it was the exact opposite. It was a gigantic wedding. Hundreds of people were there and we were at max capacity. As the night progressed, I could see the people getting more and more drunk and rambunctious, I was trying to clean and pick up in the background while everyone was dancing and having a good time, but there was only so much cleanup work that I can do with a building full of people. I decided to take a long break and just rest my eyes for a bit while the wedding was still going on. I woke up 45 minutes later and then I noticed the time. The wedding would end in about 20 minutes or so and I could get going on my cleanup work. I grabbed my headphones and made my way from the parking lot to the building. As I made the long walk up the hill, I was disgusted right away. Outside it looked like a music festival had just come through. There was trash and empty bottles everywhere. I even saw a girl lying on the grass, snoring. I went inside and the band was still playing and the inside was just as bad as the outside. Tables and chairs had been flipped over, bottles and cans were everywhere and even plates and napkins were just littered all over the floor. I was kinda angry. My bosses, the couple that owned the place, came up to me before the end of the wedding and apologized and told me that if I did a good job tonight, they would pay me extra and I could take next Friday off. Now I was mad, but it seemed like a fair trade-off. It took forever, but they finally started to empty out the place. Thankfully, they hired a bus to transport them wherever they were going because these people were in no position to drive. They only had two small party buses, so they would have to make two trips to pick up everyone. I was trying to pick up the tables and chairs, but because some people were still left behind waiting, they were throwing things and just being inconsiderate people. An hour and a half after the official ending time of the wedding, everyone was finally gone and my bosses went home for the evening. And this is the time of the night that I don't mind. 
Being alone, with my headphones working, is peaceful for me, and since I knew that I was going to be there a long time picking up after this party, I needed this peaceful time to just kind of wind down. I started outside and went from side to side, picking up trash and fixing all the patio furniture. That took a while, and then I went inside and started on the inside. It started to get cold outside, so I shut the door and continued my work. A while later, my wireless headphones died, and I figured that I would just use the speaker from my phone since nobody was around anyway. When I placed the phone on one of the tables, I noticed something strange. The door to the venue was wide open, and I distinctly remember shutting it. I went over and shouted into the air to see if anyone was there, and of course, I heard nothing back. It was kind of windy out, so I didn't think that it was that outlandish of an idea that maybe the wind had knocked it open since I didn't lock it. It had never happened before, but it doesn't mean it was impossible. I made some trips back and forth from the main hall to the kitchen. I was just about done for the night, and I noticed that the door was open again. Now I felt uncomfortable and figured maybe the owner was around, and I was just being stupid and didn't realize it. I called out the owner's name several times, but... I heard nothing back. I'm not an easily spooked guy, so my rational brain was telling me that everything was fine and I just need to finish up, lock the door and just be out. So that's exactly what I did. Once I finished, I locked the door and started walking to my car. When it was only about 30 or 40 feet away from the building, I saw the reflection of the light shine off the glass. I stopped on a dime because I knew I had turned the lights off. I turned around and saw the lights were shining brightly through the windows. I ran back, unlocked the door, and standing in the middle of the room was a man. He had suit pants on and a white buttoned up shirt with his tie loosened. Strangely, he wasn't wearing any shoes or socks though. I could clearly see right away that this guy just wasn't right. His eyes appeared to be half open and even though he wasn't moving, he was sort of swaying back and forth. I asked if he was okay and in a mumbling but angry sounding voice he said, Where's my jacket? I want my jacket. Clearly this man had too much to drink and seemed to be left behind. I tried to be civil and tell the guy to just relax and I'll help him out. I put my head down for a second to call the owner and at that moment that I had my head down, I heard his bare feet running hard on the ground. I looked up and he was running in the opposite direction of where I was standing. He ran into the kitchen, still screaming about his jacket. I called the owner and told him what was happening and he said that he would be right down since he only lived about a hundred yards away. And while I was talking to the owner on the phone, I described this man so the owner could try and contact someone from the wedding. He called the best man since we had his contact information as well as the bride and groom, and thankfully he was still awake. My boss told him about the guy and described his appearance. The best man said he didn't recognize the description of the person at the wedding, but since there were so many people, he said it might be possible that he was still there, left behind. While I was waiting for my boss to come back to the venue, I decided to go into the kitchen and try to communicate with this guy. I turned the lights on and I heard the scampering of the bare feet again on the ground. I turned in the direction of the noise, and lunging at me with a steak knife was the man. In that brief moment, I was able to block that swing and just crawl out of the kitchen and slam the door. This all happened in, I would say, only a matter of seconds. My heart was racing, and this man began to beat on the door, and all I could do was just sit there and try and hold it shut. At that moment, my boss walked in and I immediately screamed for him and begged to call the police as I was stuttering my way through what was happening as I held the door shut. The man in the kitchen was screaming, beating the door, scraping the knife against it. He wasn't saying anything really of substance other than an occasional mention of his jacket. Thank Christ, the police finally showed up and apprehended this man who seemed confused as to why he was being arrested and the wedding party was contacted the next day, and to our horror, apparently, they didn't recognize this guy. He wasn't at the wedding. When they had finally got the pictures developed and scoured through every photo, they didn't find any pictures of this man except for one photo. 
One picture toward the end of the night showed a group of guys and girls smoking cigars around a small bonfire outside, and in the background, you can see the guy walking up the hill toward the venue. It was blurry, but it was very clearly that guy. We still have no idea where this man came from and what his ultimate intentions were, and from what I was told by my boss, he may have been some crazy person, but that's all we know, or maybe even just some drunk who was trying to crash a wedding for some free booze. But ever since that night, I don't wear my headphones so I can hear my surroundings, and I always lock the door every time I go in and out. This story is still fresh in my head since it only happened two weeks ago. One of my good friends from high school got married and I was surprised to see that I was invited to the wedding. Not because we had a falling out or anything like that, because we just haven't talked since we graduated from high school and that was almost 12 years ago. At first I wasn't going to go, but then I realized how many of my old friends I would see and I got myself excited. This was a great chance for me to reconnect with my old friends and see some faces that I hadn't seen for a long time. He did send me a plus one, but I RSVP'd solo because my girlfriend was going to be out of town that weekend for work. I was bummed about going to the wedding solo since I knew all my friends were going to bring their significant others, but I was determined to enjoy myself either way. A few days before, one of my friends from high school texted me and said that he couldn't wait to see me. We had a small conversation about classic times and now I was even more excited about the wedding, until he said one small detail. Right before wrapping up our text conversation he said, it's gonna be crazy seeing everyone, even Laura is going, I still can't believe you guys broke up. I was pretty stunned by that text. I couldn't understand why on earth Laura would be invited. I asked my friend why and he said that Laura worked with the bride and they've become close over the last couple of years. And that changed everything. You see, Laura was my ex-girlfriend. We dated from about 8th grade until our junior year of college. Everybody thought that we were going to get married and at one point that was in the cards. Life always finds a way to throw you a curveball though and due to way too many reasons to list, we ended things. In the beginning, the breakup was amicable and we decided to go our separate ways. But then things got ugly, like really ugly. Laura began stalking me and even harassing women that I would go on dates with. Believe it or not, the law ended up getting involved and that was the last time that I had seen or heard from Laura and that was over five years ago. Saturday arrived and I was anxious. I joked with myself in the car that I was more anxious than the bride and groom. I tried telling myself that we were in our 30s now, and surely Laura had moved on. I figured that I would just avoid her, stick close to all my friends, and just focus on having a good time. I walked into this beautiful church where the wedding was about to start. I found a bunch of friends sitting in the back and I joined them. I scanned the church and on the other side near the middle, I saw Laura sitting there with a couple of girls I didn't recognize. I was hoping that Laura would be with a date, but it didn't look like she was with anyone. The ceremony commenced and after they were officially married, everyone departed down the aisle and behind the new couple. When I got outside, I hugged and congratulated my buddy and started walking to my car to drive to the reception. Now before opening my door, I heard a familiar voice from behind my shoulder. Hey there, stranger. And I knew right away who was greeting me. I turned around and with a friendly and civil smile, I said, Hey Laura, how are you? She smiled, and in this reserved kind of voice, she says, You know, I'm doing good. I'm happy you're here because I wanted to apologize for everything and tell you that I'm proud of everything that you've accomplished. I realized all the hell that I caused you in the end, and that was horrible. I hope you can forgive me one day, and who knows, maybe we can be friends. That caught me so off guard that I didn't even respond right away. I just stared at her for a moment and then finally said, uh, of course I forgive you, and I'd like to be friends. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll catch up at the reception. I, I'd love to know what you're up to these days. She smiled and then we went our separate ways. 
I felt a great weight lifted off my shoulders as I made the 20-minute drive to the reception. The party was a blast at first. Great food, an open bar, and some fun dancing. And just as I had expected, I was having a blast with my old friends from school, and we started talking like we hadn't missed a beat. I noticed that Laura tried to approach me a few times, but every time she did, I was in the middle of another conversation or being pulled in another direction to talk to someone else. Around nine that night, I finally got over to her to chat. She was sitting at a table alone, drinking a glass of wine. The first thing I noticed about her conversation was that she was a little off. She seemed to be in a worse mood than she was earlier, but I continued to talk with her either way. We talked about work, life, where we were living these days, and our love lives. Not in any specific detail, but just the cliff note version. I told her that I had been with my girlfriend for two years and that we were doing good. She told me that she basically had a string of dead-end relationships and was taking some time off from dating. I told her that there isn't anything wrong with that and just tried to keep speaking with some optimism. The conversation continued for a while and I felt good about it. She seemed happy when I finally left the table. We hugged and I told her that it was great catching up. I even suggested that maybe we grab a coffee sometime soon and stay in touch. She seemed into the idea and I was happy to see her like this. This Laura was completely different from the last one I saw and it truly did make me happy. When everything was over, we all went to a local bar to continue the night. The bar was about a block away from the reception. I would say maybe 15 people went to the bar and Laura was not included. We seemed to party for a while and most of the people were staying at the hotel next door. I was still sober so I was driving home. Now around 2 I started walking back to my car which was parked at the place the reception was at. When I got to my car, I noticed that the driver's side door wasn't closed all the way. This wasn't like me at all, but I considered that it may be possible that I didn't shut it all the way since so much was going on. Before I opened the door, I looked inside the vehicle through the windows and everything appeared to be in order, so I got in and started driving home. There wasn't a lot of traffic on the road, but a few cars. It wasn't until I was turning on my street that I noticed a car had been following me at some distance. Now I pulled into the driveway and was relieved when the car behind me drove past. I couldn't explain why, but I was just feeling extra jumpy. It was probably because of that slightly open car door. I was getting ready for bed and lounging on the couch going through emails and text messages from the evening that I missed. I heard a car door shut and it sounded very close to my house. All of my neighbors are extremely old so I found this pretty strange to say the least. I finished going through my messages, shut the lights off and walked to the stairs to go to the bedroom. The stairs are right in front of the front door and as I was passing the door I noticed that the handle was beginning to turn. The door was locked so whoever was trying to open it couldn't get in. I was immediately terrified, but I knew that I needed to do something, and quick. And then I saw the deadbolt lock turning. Whoever was there had a key to my front door. I heard the click of the lock, and the knob started to turn again. As the door opened, I immediately ran my shoulder into it, slamming it shut, and I heard someone shriek outside. I looked through the window, and I saw the back of a blonde-haired woman running back to this blue SUV parked on the road. The woman got into the vehicle and just peeled off. I immediately called the police, telling them everything that happened, but they just seemed so unresponsive. They said because I didn't get a good look at their face that they were very reluctant, but they ended up going to Laura's house, and when she answered the door, she claimed that she had been sleeping for a couple of hours. Basically, Nothing was done and my suspicions were proven wrong. I decided to change the locks the next day and I picked up one of those ring cameras from my door. It was nuts. It really, really was. And it's been two weeks and nothing has happened since, but I just don't feel safe. I know how Laura used to be and if she tried to break into my house, I can't even imagine what she had planned. If anything ever happens again or I have another confrontation with her, I will be sure to update this story, but until then, I just hope that I'm safe throughout the night.
This is a quick little story that happened to my husband and me three years ago when we were married. We're both unconventional people who like to do things out of the norm. We both have strange jobs, strange hobbies, and very strange personalities. It's what I was attracted to initially when I met Jake. I felt like they didn't make people like him and me, and when we found each other, we didn't want to let go. Okay, that's enough with the sappy stuff. So, after two years of dating, we knew that we wanted to get married and start a family. Jake popped the question, and of course I said yes. Since we both had small families, we thought it was a good idea to have a small ceremony and keep the budget tight, since weddings cost an ungodly amount of money. My family was okay with this, but Jake's family was a little skeptical of what we meant by a smaller, unconventional wedding. Specifically, Jake's mom, who was very religious. I know she practices some form of Christianity, but... I'm not sure which denomination. I'm sorry if this is offensive. I don't mean it to be. I wasn't raised religiously, so I don't really understand the differences. Now, during the entire planning stages of the wedding, his mom just kept pushing for the pastor or preacher or whatever he was called to be a part of the wedding. I was against it 100%, and so was Jake. His mom didn't love the idea of my gay best friend Paul being the one who marries us. She didn't say it outright, but it was written all over her face. A few weeks before the wedding, Jake and I went to his parents' house for dinner. We expected a nice quiet evening with maybe some pasta dinner or something, and his family was also very persistent that after dinner we have coffee and dessert. Right before his dad brought out the coffee, the doorbell rang. Jake's mom excitedly ran to the door, and we could hear her bubbly voice greeting and talking to someone. I had no idea who that someone was, but I could tell from Jake's expression that it wasn't good. I whispered and asked who it was, and he just quietly said, Just be cool. I'll handle this. A million ideas were swirling through my head as to who it could be. Finally, they walked back into the dining room, and his mom was grinning like the Joker or something. She was accompanied by a large man with a big red beard. He was bald only on top, and the rest of his hair was just fire red. And in this loud voice, he said, Wow, Jake, look at you, bud. The last time I saw you, you were about five foot three. Now you're a giant. Then he just laughed at his own attempt of a joke, like he had just heard the funniest thing of all time. They all made small talk for a second, and then finally Jake responds, This is my fiancé, Tabby. Uh, Tabby, this is Minister Mark. My eyes felt like they were going to explode as I shook the man's hand. I couldn't believe his parents did this. I didn't say anything, though. They all continued to talk for a while, and then things got ugly. They started on their mission for us to reconsider and get the minister to marry us in their church. Now Jake was livid and just kept telling them that we already had plans for the wedding and this wasn't going to happen. He tried explaining that for budget reasons, among others, we wanted things to be small and untraditional. I saw the minister make a strange face and then asked what untraditional meant. I couldn't sit silently anymore, so I spoke up in an annoyed but pretty confident voice. I said, it means not traditional. I'm not wearing a white dress. I'm wearing a cute black wedding dress that I found cheap online. Jake's seen my wedding dress and he'll also see me before the wedding. We don't believe any of those superstitions. We're not getting married in a church and we're not paying for some fancy banquet hall. We're having a quick ceremony in my parents' yard invited some friends and family over and we're going to party with the people that we love because that is what a wedding's that's what a wedding's about at least for us the room was quiet and the minister seemed to be red and angry in his face Jake being the voice of reason interjected and rationally explained what I meant even though I meant exactly what I said and we spent the next half hour or so exchanging pleasantries and then Eventually, we all left and went on our way. I was furious with his mom, but I understood how she was, and I dealt with it. Now, this is where people tell me I'm crazy, and that this is unrelated, but I know what I saw. That night, we were in bed and probably fell asleep not long before I heard a loud crash. We both jumped out of bed, and together we made our way down the hall and saw that the side door had been opened. Now, it was a beautiful night, so we knew that the wind couldn't have opened the door, and that wouldn't have explained the loud bang. We crept around the house and saw nothing, 
No evidence of a break-in other than the door, and we were starting to accept that maybe the door opening was just some fluke. Just as we were about to head back into the bedroom, I noticed Jake standing as still as a statue in the kitchen. Then I looked over, and he motioned for me to run back to the bedroom. I didn't, but I stood back. Jake grabbed one of his golf clubs that were right by the side door and started to tiptoe towards the door. There was a moment of silence, and then heavy footsteps ran up from the basement. We both screamed, and Jake froze for a moment. The shock of seeing a person run from your basement would probably paralyze you in that moment also. The heavy steps ran directly towards the side door, where a large man with a baseball cap was unlocking it. Jake finally snapped back and swung his club like a baseball bat. The person grunted, and the hat fell off as the man ran out into the night. I looked out the window, and I swear I saw a ring of red hair as the man ran up the street. I told Jake who I thought it was, but he didn't believe me, claiming that there was no way he was capable of something like that. He did admit that the body type looked like Mark, but he didn't think that hair was actually red, although he did say that he didn't get a great look. Now we reported this incident and apparently the cops checked out the minister and his story checked out. But I know what I saw, and the more I thought about it the more convinced I became that it was that minister. I don't know what he intended by breaking in. Maybe it was to scare us into coming to church, I don't know. But I was furious for weeks. Since my parents had a big house, I begged Jake to stay there with me for a few days until this passed. We eventually got married the way we intended, and his parents never brought up the minister or anything after that. We never saw the minister again and never had another break-in, and we're still in that same house. Maybe it was just some random break-in, and my brain chose to see what it wanted to see, but I know deep down that I saw that red hair running away. The reason I'm just now sharing this story three years later is that out of the blue my husband said, you know, maybe I did see red hair that night. Maybe it was Minister Mark. A couple of years ago, I finally got married to my longtime girlfriend. We had been dating for two years and then engaged for another four years. We both figured it was wise to finish school and establish our careers before tying the knot. Thankfully, our wedding was beautiful, but it was almost ruined at the last second, and I would be lying if I told you that there wasn't a small dark cloud looming over that day. First off, in order to protect my family, but mostly my wife's family, I'm going to refrain from using any real names in this story, as the family involved has already dealt with enough stuff, and I don't want to have anybody else getting involved in their business. When we first started dating, I met her cousin, named Mike, and this dude was wild, plain and simple. I enjoyed going out occasionally with Mike because he was what I would call a wild card. He was loud, funny, and didn't care about what he said out loud. When he was around, you knew that you were in for something crazy. The older I got, the more tired I became of Mike's antics. He seemed to be perpetually stuck in that early 20s mode, and it was becoming increasingly hard to have him around. Around the time we got engaged, we rarely saw Mike. If it wasn't a family party, we didn't see him. We would constantly hear stories from his girlfriend's parents that he was always in some kind of legal trouble. It wasn't your typical criminal stuff, though. Mike thought that he was doing what society failed to do. Those were his words, by the way. He would break in and rob extremely wealthy businesses and homes. He went as far as to jump employees of well-off businesses because he assumed every single employee must be corrupt. It was disheartening to witness someone I used to enjoy so much just evolve into this person. Now fast forward to the engagement party that we shared together. Mike came and at first it was nice catching up with him. He had recently been released from a short jail sentence and he seemed to be getting some things in his life in order. At the party, I introduced Mike to my best man, Nick. We all chatted for a while about sports, movies, and life, and then Nick mentioned that he was a cop. The expression on Mike's face instantly changed. In front of the entire party, Mike went crazy and went on an insane rant about how the police are corrupt and that Nick should rot in prison for the heinous actions of all cops. Now, needless to say, Mike was removed from the party. 
After that outburst, we all caught our breath, had a little laugh, and went back to having a good time. Nick is one of those cops who truly cares about justice and not babysitting, as he puts it. He dislikes giving tickets for trivial things and tends to let people go with warnings. He actually moved from another state that he was living in because the state laws were so strict that he found it hard to separate justice from regulation. Unfortunately for Mike, he viewed every single cop as a horrible and crooked person. Not long after the party, my friends and I went away for the weekend for my bachelor party. It wasn't one of those wild parties that you see in movies. We went to a cabin in the woods not far from a small town. We went out to eat in town and then visited one of the local dive bars for a couple of drinks. And after the brief outing, we went back to the camp to hang out and play video games all night like we were 12 again. It was my bachelor party and that's what I wanted to do. And sometime in the middle of the night, maybe at around 12 or 1, a few of my friends said that the motion light out back had turned on. I ran to the sliding door and looked outside and at first I saw nothing and then I noticed two wet footprints right outside the back door. Now, initially I laughed. I was thinking that one of the guys were playing some sort of prank on me since I was an avid horror fan. Everybody denied any involvement, creating a little bit of attention, and we all went outside to investigate. Nick led us around the cabin. There was a trail of wet footprints that went from the deck to the grass. Once in the grass, we couldn't see which way they went, which was very unnerving. We reported the incident, but as you can imagine, nothing came of it since we really had nothing to go on other than wet footprints. We decided to stay and stick it out in the cabin. Every little gust of wind or creak in the house made us jump. I will say that I felt safe with my friends, but it didn't make it any less unnerving. Around 5am I was in the living room, still wide awake. I happened to glance over at the sliding door and saw someone peering in through the window. I screamed to alert everyone in the living room, but by the time they woke up, all they saw was the person running into the woods. And that was the last straw for us, and we packed everything up and left. We alerted the cops and the property owner of the situation. At the moment, this was really unfortunate, but once we got back home, it became a wild story that we all kinda got to share with each other, and for that reason, I guess it was memorable. We assumed at the time that it was some crazy person who lived in the town and that they were just trying to scare us. The night before the wedding we all got together for the rehearsal dinner. After dinner, a few of us gathered for some drinks, and since I had a few drinks, Nick was going to drive me home. While we were driving home we noticed a car following extremely close with its high beams on. Nick tried to maneuver away from the car but they followed every move he made. At this point, he realized that whoever that was, they were messing with us. Nick called one of his buddies who was on duty and told him what was going on. He was only about five minutes away. I'm not sure why Nick decided to do what he did next, but he pulled over, and the car behind us pulled over as well. Nick stayed in the car and told me to do the same. Then a person emerged from the car parked behind us and made its way over to our car. He seemed to be wearing a mask and... When he reached the driver's side window, he then demanded that Nick get out. I was terrified and hoped that Nick's buddy would show up soon. He tried to reason with this masked man and the man wasn't having any of it. He started banging on the locked door with some type of object. I was terrified of what that object might be and I just wanted this whole ordeal to end. The masked man broke the window, shattering the glass inside, and started to grab at Nick, trying to drag him out of the car. I think this is what Nick wanted though. As soon as the man started to reach into the car to grab Nick, Nick kicked open the door, knocking the masked man over. Nick kicked his hand and whatever he was holding in his hand went flying. He was able to restrain the masked man on the ground and I saw him screaming and squirming on the ground but Nick kept him detained until his buddy showed up a minute or two later. The police officer quickly detained him and I felt like getting sick as he walked by the car with handcuffs and the mask removed. You see, it was my soon-to-be wife's cousin. After taking care of all the legal stuff that night, I went home and told her everything that had happened. She was incredibly embarrassed and just thankful that I was okay. 
Apparently, her cousin came clean and admitted that he didn't like Nick solely because he was a cop. He was quoted as saying, I wanted to teach him a lesson. Cops need to be punished, and I was going to do my family a favor and spare them from this monster. Luckily, the family was spared from the only monster around, you see. It was a bleak night and a dark morning, but once the wedding commenced, the dark clouds seemed to go away and we had a great wedding. It's crazy to me that monsters aren't always strangers in the shadows, but sometimes they're our very own blood. Once you're engaged, a wedding has a lot of prerequisites. To name a few, wedding bands, venues, food, dresses, suits, guest lists, rehearsal dinners, and bachelor and bachelorette parties. Preparing for all of this is one of the most exciting and stressful times of your life. But for me in particular, it was made a lot easier with the support of family and friends. Everything had gone easy thus far. We picked our wedding venue after the second tour. The venue had a florist, DJ, and food and bakery services all lined up so that we didn't have to look outside for any of that if we didn't want to. I think we used most of their services, maybe only went outside for the flowers or the DJ. Honestly, I can't remember. The wedding date was rapidly approaching and my friends and I decided to take a trip to a small beach town on the east coast for a low-key bachelor party. The plan was to mostly hang out, cook on the grill, spend a lot of time at the beach, and maybe visit some local breweries or bars at night. We rented a house on the beach for two nights, and everyone pitched in to grab food, drinks, and other supplies. It was a perfect getaway and an opportunity to hang out with all of my friends who had since moved to different parts of the country after high school and college. On the first night, we decided to go out to a club. It was a place a few of the guys had been to before and came highly recommended. They featured a mixture of live music and DJs throughout the night, and I'm not the biggest drinker, so clubs and bars aren't usually my scene, but this place made it easy to grab a drink and just enjoy the music. Before I knew it, we were taking shots and having an absolute blast. About an hour before closing, I was hanging around the bar with a few of my buddies. They were still grabbing drinks, but I had to cut myself off. I walked over to see if they could grab me some water while they were getting their drinks, and I froze for a second. I swore that directly on the other side of the bar was my ex, whom I'll call Jess for this story. The person turned away quickly so I couldn't really tell for sure. I bumped into my buddy Brad and said, Hey, is that Jess over there? And he looked over in that direction, threw his arms up, and took a sip of his drink. Now for some context, Jess and I had a very difficult breakup that led to some harassment. I hadn't seen her or even thought about her in over seven years, but I shook it off pretty quickly, figuring that it was the alcohol playing with my eyes. The next morning, a couple of my buddies and I got up and took a walk around town and down to the beach. I always feel better after getting up and getting some fresh air after drinking. When we got back to the house, there was a six-pack of beer and a letter attached to the front door. I had Joe open the letter and see what it was, and it read, I hope you had the best time. You deserve it. He flipped the note around, and it had what looked like a lipstick kiss on it. And I asked if this was a joke, and he said, If it is, I don't know anything about it. I went inside and pulled my best man aside, saying, Hey, do you know anything about this? Is Joe playing another one of his tricks on me? My best friend assured me that he had no idea about any of it and that no one besides me and the two other guys had even gone outside that morning. I told him that I thought I saw Jess at the bar the night before. I wasn't sure, but this note was now officially starting to freak me out. Knowing I'm always a super anxious person, he told me to relax and not to worry about it and that he would ask around to see if it was one of the guys. The rest of the trip went off without a hitch and we had a blast. We had an absolutely fantastic wedding and I couldn't have asked for a better day. Now about three to four months after my wedding I was catching up with my best man who was himself preparing to get married the following summer. We started talking about his plans and what he was thinking for a bachelor party. He then quickly switched the conversation and said, Hey, I need to tell you something but you promise you won't be mad? And I replied, Yeah, sure I won't be mad. 
I figured that he was going to tell me that he had chosen someone else as his best man, which wouldn't have made me mad, you know? And he says, Remember your bachelor party when we got that letter? The one with a six pack of beer? Now, kind of concerned, I said, Yeah? Was that you? He took a breath and said, No, it wasn't. But if you remember, when everyone left for the beach to go grab one of the volleyball spots, I, I stayed back to hang out and shower and just grab some breakfast. Well, when I was getting ready to head down to the beach and meet everyone, I went outside and Jess was outside the house, looking like she was trying to get into one of the windows. I felt my heart beating, and I screamed what at the top of my lungs. His head was down, and he continued, yeah. She was trying to get in the house or something, and when I yelled, she stormed over to me, demanding to know where you were and that she needed to talk to you. She went on this entire rant about how no one else deserved to be with you and that she thought you two should still be together. She looked like she was out of her mind, man. Her eyes were wide, hair all over the place. It honestly looked like she hadn't slept in a week. I don't remember everything she was shouting, but I basically told her that if she didn't leave, I was calling the cops, and I told her and not so nice a way, to never ever come around you or your fiancé again. I was floored. I didn't even know what to say. I think the first thing out of my mouth was thank you and I'm sorry you had to deal with that. And that's how I felt. I was so thankful for a friend who not only handled the situation but also waited until after my wedding to tell me that. I was so nervous and anxious that another incident would occur. And I now live in a different state from where my wife and I got married and I don't get to see friends and family as much, but we are very excited about the life we're building here. Being in a different state also gives me hope that I'll never run into her ever again. So, I'm sort of the outcast of my family. My brother became a lawyer, and my cousins all became doctors, nurses, and even college professors. And then there's me. I dropped out of film school during my second year, and I make my living bartending. Due to the nature of my job, I do meet a nice number of questionable individuals, but they're all mostly harmless. One night early in the summer a few years back, I went to my parents' house for dinner, and the entire family was there. It quickly turned into the Let's Lecture Shannon show. They played all the classic hits like, Why can't you be more like your brother? When are you going to find someone to settle down with? You do know your childbearing years don't last forever. Oh, you know, just what every child wants to hear from their parents at a family get-together. I was pretty annoyed, and it showed when I got to work that evening. I was venting to a co-worker when a nice-looking man whom I didn't recognize as a regular spoke up. He said in this sort of deep, rugged tone, well, It just sounds like your parents don't get you. I can tell by looking at you, you're a free spirit. You play by your own rules, and I think that's why you give off this unique energy. Yeah, believe it or not, that stupid line worked on me for some reason. Or maybe it was because this guy was really good looking, I don't know. I continued the conversation with him for a while, and we ended up talking all night. I closed the bar and we went back to my place for the night and had a few more drinks. I was actually really into this guy and I just met him. When we woke up in the morning, he made me scramble eggs and suggested something crazy. He said with confidence and in that deep, sexy voice, Hey, let's elope. I know that's crazy, but Vegas is only three hours away. And then you can tell your parents that you met a guy. And now you're married. This guy knew exactly what chords to hit with me. I knew in my stomach this was a horrible idea since I didn't know this guy at all, but I wasn't thinking that way at the time. I was thinking about getting back in my parents, and to me, it was just marriage, like people get divorced all the time if it doesn't work out. And so I agreed, and I called into work for my night shift. Right after breakfast, we got into the car and started our trip to Vegas. It was crazy, but I was excited about this. We talked about getting married and what we wanted to do and things like that, and we were about an hour away from Vegas when I realized that he didn't tell me anything about himself. Where he was from, where he was living, even his last name, I didn't know. That pit in my stomach was growing bigger and bigger the closer we got to Vegas. 
I asked him what his last name was and he just smiled and said, Well, you'll find out soon. Don't you worry about that. I still don't know why I was going along with it at this point. I think the idea of throwing this in my parents' face was still my driving force, though. We weren't far from Vegas when I noticed that he got off the highway at some random exit that I didn't even recognize. I told him that we needed to stay longer, and he said, No, this is a shortcut, a special place I know about. It's cheaper, and it's nice. I know the girl who runs it. I didn't say anything because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know anything about Vegas, but I was pretty sure there wasn't a secret side entrance into an actual city. I mean, maybe there was, I didn't know. Wherever we were now looked like the middle of the desert. There was hardly anything on the road, and it looked like a scene from Mad Max. I started to grill him with questions, like what he did for a living, how did he know this place, and if he was sure that he was making the right decision. He seemed to be dismissive, and he just kept saying stuff like, Hey... I love you, baby. I, I know there's a connection. Trust me. There's a reason the universe brought us together. Finally, I started coming to my senses, started to sober up, as they say, and I was worried it was too late. It was becoming quite clear that this dude was up to something. I told him that I really needed to use the restroom and that it was an emergency. He said that I needed to wait until we got there, but I basically begged him to stop, which he finally did. I went into the bathroom, and I called my mom. I apologized for what I was doing, and I told her that I didn't feel safe. She didn't judge me or beat me down. She just told me to turn on my phone location and try to stay where I was as long as I could, and she could head to my location. She told me that if things really did start going south, text her one single letter, and she'll know to alert the police. I got back into the car, and he could tell something was off. He started demanding that I tell him what was wrong, and I just stuck to my story and told him that I was fine and was just tired. I told him that I would be excited once we finally arrived at the wedding chapel. Another 45 minutes of driving, we eventually pulled up to what looked like an old garage or something. I looked confused and asked why we were there. He told me some wild story about how this place was like this secret location to get married, like a speakeasy but for elopers. It sounds insane as I write it, but this deep into the situation, this guy had such a way with his words that a chunk of me honestly still wanted to believe him. I got out and stood and glanced at my surroundings. There was literally nothing in sight other than just desert. I asked if Vegas was close, and he said it's like five miles away. He told me to head inside and that he would be inside in a minute. He wanted to grab a suit out of the trunk. I walked slowly to the door of the garage and I looked back at him, digging through the trunk. I noticed that he had a duffel bag that was too small for a suit, and before I went inside the garage I heard a noise coming from the other side of the door. There was a small window next to the door and I looked through the window before opening the door. Crouched over, with a hood, was some person right behind the door. I looked back at my lovely groom-to-be and he was still digging for something. I decided to text my mom one letter as she suggested, and I ran to the back of the building and hid behind some barrels. Now from my vantage point I was able to see him make his way to the door and he kept looking in both directions. When he opened the door, I heard them speaking but I couldn't really tell what they were saying. Seconds later he ran outside and started to nervously yell my name. Whoever the other guy was said that they needed to leave right now, and I see them both run to his gray car and drive off, leaving nothing but a dust cloud. I stayed right put where I was for a little over an hour, until eventually two police cars showed up and I gave them a report of what had happened. We waited for my parents, who gave me a big hug when they arrived and I told the police everything I knew and what type of car I thought it was. I didn't really pay attention to that for some reason. I knew it was a grey four-door car and I think it was maybe a Ford and I gave the description of the guy, told him everywhere that we had gone and hoped that maybe a camera would pick us up, but unfortunately, these guys were never caught. I didn't work at that bar much longer and started working for my brother shortly after. Whenever I see a grey car slow down anywhere near me, my heart still stops. I don't know exactly what was going to happen to me, but I'm so grateful I finally came to my senses when I did. 
because if I had walked into that garage, I may not be sitting here writing this story today. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data. Look at it anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below, friends. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, comedians can't be cute.